I'm a senior developer relations manager for AI and chemistry and material science at NVIDIA. I have background doing research specifically in this domain, which is uh, neural network and atomic potentials. A lot of my work is focused on how to make them uh, more general. Um, uh, so a lot of work around data set generation, active learning, things like that. Um, in this talk, I'm going to try to uh, not be completely redundant because it seems like a lot of the things you guys are working on show up in my talk in one way or another. So <laughs> it would be really interesting to see how we could potentially collaborate on um, you know, accelerating the methods you guys are working on, if there's hardware changes you think that could be made that would make uh, the approaches you're, you're developing more efficient. Oh. Now it's not working. There we go. Uh, well, I mean, you guys know the applications of machine learning. And <laughs> <laughs> let's save some time and go about past that. You guys know the reason why we're doing it, so let's go past that. Neural network and atomic potentials, they work just like machine learning and atomic potentials. You basically have some atom in a box. This green, green uh, thing is the box, the space of, uh, that they exist in. This could be a periodic system. Uh, and effectively, uh, you have some local cutoff radius that you then want to build an atomic descriptor that then feeds into a neural network potential. You get an atomic energy out. This is the high dimensional neural network HDNMP architecture, which was, I think, originally proposed by Baylor and Perinello, but this idea of like atomic site energies go back a really long way. Uh, and how these feed into molecular dynamics? Well, you guys know this, so I'm gonna skip that. <laughs> uh, what's amazing about this is that these, these neural network interatomic potentials um, have been able to show uh, what, what I think is an extreme level of generality, especially when given the right data sets. And um, the problem is this takes us back to a really empirical science. We really have to start thinking empirical about this, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and these are a couple movies that are just examples of things from past research that I've been involved in where we have been able to train data sets to, in this case, just small molecules that weren't even, it's never seen a protein, it's never seen a drug bound to a protein binding pocket and we were able to get stable simulations. Um, and actually there's some recent work on this, testing these methods in actual uh, free energy of binding calculations. And um, turns out it kind of works. And this model was not actually trained for this specific task. So imagine if we focused and said, hey, we wanna make this problem actually work. Uh, and then materials, uh, this is an example of an aluminum paper I'll talk a little bit about later um, that was you know, it's boring, it's aluminum, it's a single element, but what's really neat about it is the, the broad level of coverage of chemical space that, that the model um, is able to cover. Uh, there's other types of neural network interatomic potentials besides the one that I showed a minute ago. There's these um, graph convolution neural network models. It's a really like basic diagram. It doesn't cover all of them, but the idea is uh, out the end of your neural network, you don't just get an energy, you get something like a latent space that then feeds back and tells you how to build your descriptor. So now your descriptor is no longer fixed. It's based on feedback from the local chemical environment. And by doing this, you, you effectively get longer range interactions uh, implicitly from the model. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat's messed up. And of course, you know, it works the same way as everything else. Negative gradient of energies equals forces, and you can use this in MD simulations. Um, something fun I did, I just kind of went to PubMed and like <laughs> Googled uh, or basically put in MD publications and then looked at like the MD publications that are actually using active, uh, AI these days. And it turns out that in about the 20, say 14 to 2018 timeframe, things started to really accelerate. And then after that, it's kind of like stagnated where it's growing at a percent a year. And so if you, you extrapolate in about 90 years, we'll have 50% of the market. <laughs> <laughs> so, totally not scientific, understand, but it's a, it's a, it's a neat thing to think about, like, what, what is the holdup? Like, is there, is there some reason these methods are not being adopted more in molecular dynamics simulations? Is there a better search query I could put in? Possibly. Um, there's a whole bunch of models in this space of neural network potentials. SNAP is usually used on linear, but they've been playing around with neural networks lately. Uh, and just this whole list of a bunch of amazing models. There's these kind of fixed descriptor-based models that I talked about, and then these message-passing-based models um, that kind of have an implicit long-range interactions built in. Uh, but what's really nice is a DeepMD kit in 2020 won the Gordon Bell Prize. SNAP was a finalist in 2021. Almost every year there is a, yeah, again? Yeah, just the ACE potentials here. 
But default, those are linear models. Yeah, so, I might have accidentally left that. But you could throw it into a neural network. Hint, hint. <laughs> yes, I, I, I would be interested in your comment, right? So like, how much is the complexity necessary in the descriptor, or how much complexity do we need in the model mapping descriptor space to add quantum energies? And I think complexity in the descriptor space is probably the most important thing. Um, just based on, I mean, you know, if you put pairs into a neural network, what are you going to get out? <laughs> I, you know, a really basic way of thinking, but I think the, the, the um, you know, higher order body that you can go and say your descriptor, the better you're, they're going to end up being in terms of accuracy. But you pay for these things, right? These things all end up costing more in the end. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's great to think about, like, uh, Where's the trade-off between what kind of uh, complexity we, do we need in our descriptor and our model to get like the right um, uh, to get something that's applicable in a normal time time frame? Uh, you know, one of the things I don't think I go into. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll talk about this here. So, uh, so why is adoption so slow? Um, I'm going to give the neural network interatomic potential perspective, and you're going to see a whole lot of overlaps with just general machine learning interatomic potentials. Models are too slow. Um, their current NNIPs are orders of magnitude slower than basically force fields or EAM models or um, um, these other like really fast approaches people use. They require a lot more data. That's a problem. That's problematic. Um, data set generation is hard or too slow just because you have to build huge data sets. Lack of ready to use models and code for non-experts. That's important if we want like people to adopt these methods. And it looks like these are things that this workshop is focusing on, which is really good. Uh, general transferable models, that, that would be nice. The more general we can make models, the more people can just pick them up and use them. But there's always trade-offs there. Do the models need to be bigger? Does it make them slower? Things like that. Data generation frameworks, uh, for, for instance, we're going to talk a bit about active learning, which was hinted on here. Uh, these need to be developed to make it easy for people to build their data sets. Uh, lack of easy to use interfaces to common MD packages, except LAMPS. LAMPS is doing really good at this. <laughs> uh, bio codes seem to not be doing so well at this, but since it's a material science workshop, you could probably like scratch that one out. <laughs> uh, engineering uh, common physics functionality um, on uh, GPUs with backprop, for example, Ewald summation, batch sampling methods, neighbors lists. So are these methods efficient when they're put into machine learning frameworks? Should we implement them in CUDA or something really, you know, some really fast language on GPUs to make sure they're as efficient as possible? Um, and uh, lack of meaningful validations, which I think, you know, it this talk so far has touched on most of these <laughs> in some way or another. Uh, or sorry, the, the, the updates touched on it. Uh, so data set generation through active learning. I'm going to talk a good bit about that. That's um, my background. It's where I think we're going to see in the future we get the most gain out of uh, these methods um, compared to, you know, say, model development. Model development's important. There's a lot of things to be done there. But if you don't have a good data set, your model's not going to work very well. Um, so the, the idea is you have some uh, cycle. You have an initial data set. You train some model or set of models, depending on how you do your uncertainty estimate. There's this ensemble-based uncertainty metric where you can uh, use the ensemble to tell you effectively when you're uncertain based on the disagreement of the, the predictions. Um, there is a sampling step where you sample from some domain of interest. You then do some kind of sampling like molecular dynamic simulations. Doesn't necessarily have to be that. Could be a biased molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, you then uh, uh, do your uncertainty metric as these simulations run. And when your potential is no longer trustworthy or your uncertainty is very high, you um, Take your, you basically generate new quantum chemistry labels, add it to your training set, retrain. And typically, this is done uh, in a batched approach. There's a, a really good paper that was published um, out of uh, University of Stuttgart um, by uh, Victor and Johannes. And they did, um, basically, the, they talk about, you know, why do we need this batched active learning? So chemical space is too complex and high dimensional for random selection. Meaning, if a human looks at it, is there a way we can just randomly pick things? Probably not. Um, entry, entry maximization work by uh, Danny is, is, is one way of thinking about this, is you know, how do we get more diversity in our data sets? Uh, this is, um, and, and this fact that it's really hard to do is true for both, both configurational and confirmational space. So configurational, think of like 
different phases of material, different uh, graphs of molecules, things like that. Um, and good data selection methods, uh, what, what they come up with, um, have three requirements. So informativeness, diversity, and representativeness. And in this plot, they show going from like, if you only meet one of those to if you meet all three, what, kind, what would your data selection look like? And you'd get something like this, which covers the space of your, um, they're, they're selecting basically from this gray set. And uh, so they, they I, I like the way that they think about this problem because I had not thought about it in this way before. I generally just ran a simulation, selected what I wanted to sample, ran a simulation, and let the uncertainty quantification do its job. But in the end, if you're doing things correctly, uh, it should look something like this. Um, and iteratively over time, uh, you know, if you, if you do this uncertainty selection, it should look something like all three in the end. But if you can do this more accurately, design an uncertainty quantification approach that meets all three of these requirements, then, um, then, then you can do uh, active learning more efficiently. So uh, I, when I was at Los Alamos, we worked on building a framework for active learning. There's this um, ALF code, which is now open source on GitHub. Um, the idea behind it is it's fully autonomous, meaning once you, you just set it, let it run on a cluster, uh, it, it basically um, spawns out jobs, runs quantum chemistry calculations, runs sampling jobs, runs training. Uh, it has interchangeable QM methods. You just build an interface to QM packages to plug into it. Uh, interchangeable machine learning models, similar thing. If you have a different machine learning model you want to use, you can just interface it to the active learning framework. Um, an assortment of built-in sampling methods, uh, built-in testing suite, and uh, capable of scaling to thousands of nodes, which we, we did in a couple of different works. Uh, and you could, in theory, use this for both materials and molecules. There's no reason you couldn't, as long as the sampling approaches you have in there are um, you know, good enough for, for whatever it is you're trying to simulate. And uh, Kipton and Barrows and Ben Nevian, we were kind of the original crew who worked on this. There's a whole lot of people working on it now at Los Alamos um, that are supporting it. So they're still doing really good work on this. Uh, so I, I want to talk a bit about how, how we should think about building a general model. Um, uh, in, this, in this diagram, effectively, I show the space of all, let's say, three-dimensional at, uh, point, point atoms in, in some space including unphysical configurations, things we'd consider extreme conditions, things we'd consider a liquid phase, things we'd consider a crystal phase, might look something like this. Um, typically, you know, sampling methods for ML potentials would, would go directly to the thing they want to sample. So they would sample a crystal phase, they'd sample a liquid phase. But, uh, and and that's, what, that's what actually was done uh, in, in even in an active learning framework in 2019 by uh, Roberto Carr and Wayne Ani. Um, they basically sampled aluminum uh, starting from the crystal structure and out into liquid phase to try and sample all these different regions of space. And they show really great results from doing this with DeepMD. Uh, but well, the question we had being at Los Alamos is, what if we want to really sample these extreme conditions? Because these are things that Los Alamos cares about. If you hit a material really hard and a shock wave goes through it, does that look like a liquid? Probably not. Not exactly. There's defects and stuff that, that form in it. So, we need to be able to sample those defects. How do we do that? Um, well, one thing we thought about was, can we just start from random disorder and then have the model discover the chemistry that gets you down into, say, the crystal phases and liquid phases we care about? Um, and can we learn physics starting from this point? Uh, so we took over Sierra when it was still an open cluster uh, for a short period of time, which is a supercomputer with a very large number of V100 GPUs. And we, we basically ran active learning for a week, and out the other end, we got a potential. And so uh, I'm not going to go, I don't have time to go in really deep detail on it. If you're interested in checking out all the results, we try to look at things like phase diagrams, um, melting points. You know, we don't just look at like RMA, uh, RMSE, MAE, things like that. Uh, and we actually ran a shock simulation with it and then evaluated RMA, so, so force error basically of a point in a cluster as they form throughout the simulation. So we went back and ran quantum chemistry on clusters. And then we validated that this is a good test by looking at effectively, is our model actually accurate as we grow cluster size? Turns out it is. 
Um, and what was really cool about this is, is shown in this T-SNE plot. So we basically did um, a T-SNE plot, which is a T-stochastic distributed neighbor analysis. It's a way of a dimensionality reduction. So we, we took, I think it's like the second layer of the neural network potential and used this as our, um, as our latent space that we built these out of to, to do the domain reduction. And this space up here with really, really high force error is this random space of junk that we initially started all of our active learning simulations from. And this space down here is actually the relevant chemistry space. As you can see, liquid phase sampling is in this region. This is a bunch of shocked atom environments that show up in the space. And these are all a whole bunch of crystal structures that we did not tell it to sample, and it's still sampled. So it, it just goes to show that uh, if, you, if you think about how to make these models as general as possible, you can end up discovering potentially new phases of material. This is boring for aluminum, but maybe in the future when we're looking at other materials, this would actually be um, something that's valuable. Uh, there's a really cool work done in 2014 with TerraChem, a GPU accelerated uh, uh, quantum chemistry code from Todd Martinez's lab. And uh, they looked at this, they, had, they built this ab initio nanoreactor, and they um, showed that they could discover glycine formation pathways with this. The way this thing worked is you'd take a bunch of molecules, you put them in a box, you'd smash them together, you see what things form out of it. Uh, and from this, you can capture reaction pathways, you can uh, then you know, go refine it more with quantum chemistry methods to try and get, um, uh, to try and get uh, something like rates out of it. Uh, and what we were thinking is, if we were trying to build a machine learning interatomic potential or neural network potential that was extremely general for reactive chemistry, maybe this is one of the ways to go to build your data sets. Uh, so that's what we, we did. Um, this, this paper took about five years to get out, so we, I think we started it in 2018. It took a really long time to do just because a um, whole lot of life things and COVID. <laughs> but we eventually got it done. Uh, and our end result was effectively a potential that shows uh, unprecedented generality across five distinct um, cases. We went into literature, we found a bunch of REACTS-FF studies, DFTB studies, other types of potentials that people use to study reactive chemistry, and we tried to reproduce the results that they got to see how we compared. Do we get better results in some experimental cases? Um, Yeah, and, and one of the cases I show here is, is just reproducing that Miller experiment, the, the produ production of glycine just from random small molecules. Um, and what we see is that uh, our potential with a four nanosecond uh, high temperature MD simulation on this box actually does end up forming glycine. Uh, a lot of the pathways that we discovered show up in uh, quantum chemistry literature, so they match to what you'd expect to get. But the, you know, the really interesting part about this paper is that the active learning only ever started from small molecules, these tiny little things, drive it at high temperature, apply some non-equilibrium dynamics to it, and then you see just a whole lot of reactions occur. And any of you who know the ANTI-1X data set, um, this is a comparison of the ANTI-1X NR, which is the nanoreactor data set, to the ANTI-1X data set. ANTI-1X data set is a bunch of near-equilibrium small molecules, organic chemistry. Um, this uh, ANTI-1X in our data set, um, as you can see, covers a much broader space of chemistry. Uh, in fact, if you look closely, you can see these little islands of things in the, the red, which is the ANTI-1X data set, and you can see pathways formed between, uh, between all of these little islands. Those pathways are effectively reactions. It's turning one chemical environment into another. So it's um, you know, really interesting. We, we can look at this for all of the elements, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. Uh, does this mean that ANTI-1X NR is better than ANTI-1X 2X? No, they're, they're meant for different purposes. ANTI-1X NR is meant for uh, high temperature reactive chemistry. It was built with a really bad DFT, <laughs> and we admit that. Um, thinking in the future about you know, using transfer learning or something to try and make it a more accurate potential. Um, uh, so really, another really cool thing that we did, we evaluated the molecules that showed up in this data set. So effectively, uh, these are all molecules we discovered that showed up in our training set. This is the distribution of sizes of molecules that showed up. Um, and the reason this is really cool is because, again, all of the molecules that we put in the initial nanoreactor were small, one atom, two atom systems, uh, well, heavy atoms, so not including hydrogen. 
And this is uh, another example. So aside from just that, um, that case of applying uh, any one X and R to, to the discovery, you know, to, to finding the, the uh, pathway, the reaction pathway to create glycine. This is an example of us using it to study something that you would expect to get without ever having actually targeted this. I'm trying to get this movie to run, but it's not running. Come on. There we go. Uh, without actually having targeted, say, building, uh, uh, without actually specifically targeting carbon. So the idea is we built three boxes, uh, three different densities, low density, medium density, high density. We run a very high temperature simulation. And after many nanoseconds of simulation, we see we get the expected um, phase of the material out. We get diamond cubic, graphite, uh, basically stacked carbon sheets and fullerene sheets. And this video over here is uh, basically the, the bottom one, the 0.5 grams per cc, and it shows how it goes all the way from just random carbons in a box to, uh, to, to these, um, basically these fullerene sheets here. Now keep in mind, this is the same potential that we used to do the study on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, the glycine formation pathways. Uh, we also did a couple other studies. We looked at um, combustion simulations to produce uh, an expected product, compared it to the uh, literature result, so very close to it. We looked at uh, longer sampling. Uh, so, so we took this study, which was done with a density functional type binding, and what we were able to see is that we get a better match to experiment for at what ratio of O2 uh, acetylene that we stop producing uh, six-member rings. Uh, in that paper, they found it to be about 0.25, so they stopped forming it around here. And, but they were only able to run these simulations for a very short period of time because DFTB is much more expensive. And so, uh, as you can see here, we were able to run it for 10 nanoseconds, uh, each of the simulations, and we see formation all the way up to uh, 0.5 and a kind of spurious formation around 0.86. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the problems that show up. Let's see how much time I have. Okay, I'm doing good on time. Uh, some of the problems that show up in uh, active learning that, are, that I've found to be bottlenecks. Um, uh, I want to think about, you know, what are the, the methods we can develop that or code we can write that are going to kind of fix these bottlenecks for us. And one of them is this interesting idea that uh, I, I, I hear this a lot. Training speed does not matter. You only train once. Um, that's kind of true. If you're building general models, though, and you need to do active learning, uh, training speed really does matter with active learning. You have to train a lot, you know, 50, 60 times. Uh, and as your data set grows, training becomes more expensive part, piece of the pie. And, and, and in fact, sampling does too, because as your model gets more confident, samples longer before you find new uh, systems that you want to generate data for. Uh, and so uh, uh, what you see is that eventually, over time, from start to finish of the active learning process, these two can take up quite a, bit, a big piece of the pie. And then it's not just about optimizing your quantum chemistry code anymore. It's now about optimizing your training speed and your sampling speed. <clears throat> Uh, we also looked at, um, so, so this got us thinking, uh, is there, which we already talked a bit about this, batching molecular dynamic simulations. Makes sense. GPUs are really big. And um, uh, are there, you know, what are the best ways to do it? Uh, wh when is the case that we should go from something like MPS to, uh, to an actual kernel level batching? That's what this shows here. So we, we have a little bit of work on looking at uh, comparing like a baseline serial MD just running one after the other on a GPU versus MPS, which is um, NVIDIA's built-in way of running uh, simultaneously uh, calculations uh, on a GPU. And then a kernel uh, built approach that, uh, you know, I'll run this movie and you can see it. Hmm. None of the movies want to play, so, oh, there it goes. <laughs> Uh, so as you can see, it, it, if you, you can run a whole big batch of these at a time. And we've got a great product team at NVIDIA who's, who's kind of playing around with these ideas and, and doing the initial um, 
process of looking into to how efficient these methods are. Is it, is it worth the time, worth the effort? Um, so, you know, let me know what you think about these things. Uh, oh, also, it's, it's extremely memory efficient compared to, say, MPS. That's another thing I didn't show a plot for, but we should think about is, uh, is, is how to make these methods more memory efficient. Uh, oh, and I guess I should say, uh, there is a point here where, you know, when you get to certain size systems, uh, basically the batching approach isn't going to work any better than the MPS approach. They're going to effectively work the same. That probably is in the thousands of atoms range from what we've seen. Uh, if you go smaller to like really small molecules, then, then it probably gets more efficient to do batch level. These are, these are all kind of insights we found from this. We've also, um, in some work I've done with Los Alamos uh, in, in the science realm, we've thought about uh, are there, uh, you know, science approaches we can use to make sampling faster rather than just, um, you know, the, the hard coding approach? And one of the things we tried was this um, basically uh, uncertainty-driven mole uh, molecular dynamics. So think about it as like uh, a biased MD where you don't have to pick your collective variable. Your collective variable is your bias. So you sample um, to push your systems towards the higher um, uncertainty regions. Uh, and this... this uh, figure here shows a really good example of, of uh, what happens when you're running molecular dynamics. Uh, when you're running active learning for molecular dynamics, you're, um, oh, is that the average time? Yeah, so this, uh, this shows basically the average time that a simulation took to run in, in, in the batch of all simulations of, for a given active learning iteration. And so, as you can see, early on, before we had any bias turned on, all of them started taking, you know, running for a significant, more significant portion of time, about 175 picoseconds here. Um, in actual practice in doing this, these can be like nanosecond long. And then in that case, they start to become bottlenecks in your actual sampling. Here we, uh, sure. Yes. Basically, the time it takes until it finds an outlier or finds, you know, high uncertainty uh, sample. Um, and so once we turn this bias switch on, you can see it, at 350 Kelvin, regular molecular dynamics just kind of stays really high. Uh, and 200, by the way, is the max we had set for sampling time in this little toy case. So it, it pretty much maxed out immediately. For um, six, so we, we tested going to just higher temperatures. So what if we just go to 600 Kelvin MD then? Uh, well, you get, a, you get a similar thing. It drops really quick, but then it comes back really fast. Uh, if you go to 1,000 Kelvin, it kind of, you know, then it stays out here, so it's actually probably blowing the molecule apart in most cases. <laughs> um, so what we wanted to do is, is try this uncertainty sampling on this, but at the 350 Kelvin temperature. And you can see there's a nice, clear, uh, it's, it's, it's picking up a lot more uncertainty, and then it, it eventually starts coming out to be uh, higher. And there's like a, there's a parameter that we can tune there to make the uncertainty bias stronger. So whenever this happens, you could effectively make that uncertainty bias a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger as it gets too expensive. And then you don't spend uh, all day sampling, basically. This is a really cool example where um, we show that you're able to uh, force this thing to sample the reaction of moving this hydrogen between, uh, between oxygens. There's a, there's a plot that I should have included here that, so, th so basically it shows like the uncertainty, like a surface of the uncertainty. But there's a really cool plot I should have uh, shown here that shows like the distance between this hydrogen and this oxygen and this hydrogen and this oxygen. And at 350 Kelvin, it never jumps. But as soon as you turn on that uncertainty bias, it's like bouncing back and forth between them. It's really, really neat. Um, okay. Uh, so, uh, this was touched on also in the updates today about how should we be, be validating these potentials. There's a really cool work that came out from uh, MIT, Northwestern University, and Microsoft Research that looked at, um, uh, basically, they, they, they come to the conclusion that forces are not enough. So, if we just look at force MAE, where does that really get us? Um, and there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of that happening in the field in terms of there's benchmarks, um, uh, that people try to fit to and they claim victory, they get a lower number. What, what, what these guys say is what we need to be looking at is just you know, a set of things. So for example, force MA is one. It's a good, good, easy thing to cover. But if we're trying to run molecular dynamics with our potential, we should have some measure of stability. This is a good idea. We can argue about how we should define stability, that's true. Um, but I think you know, thinking about this path about how we define stability is important. And what you can see is that some of the potentials here, they do 
they do get a very low force MAE compared to others, but then they, they aren't very stable. They, don't, they don't, aren't able to sample for very long. And this could be, you know, data set problems, could be the potentials overfit for some reason, um, you know, various things. But uh, really, if we're going to be comparing these models, we need to be looking at things like RDFs, things like diffusion constants. We need to be looking at the whole gambit of uh, properties that we're going to be interested in. And then, um, you know, I think then we'll really get this kind of insight into which of these potentials is actually performing better. Uh, Another fun thing I like to point out is this. Um, when I was at uh, Los Alamos very early on, when I was still a student there, uh, Nick and I were developing both Hippinen and Annie, uh, the Annie architecture. And uh, they're both neural networks. One's a message passing. The other is just um, a local uh, fixed descriptor model. Uh, and what we notice is that on certain benchmarks, so QM9, for instance, the original Hippinen always beat out the Annie potential on QM9. Uh, I could, you know, no matter what I did, hyperparameter researching anything, I couldn't get it any lower than 0.29, and, and he was able to get to 0.24. And then on the Annie 1x data set, which is a, a much different data set, it's, um, so, so the QM9, if you don't know, it's basically a whole bunch of equilibrium small molecules, 130,000 of them. The Annie 1x data set is about 5 million-ish um, small molecules, similar to that, but they're non-equilibrium, so they're off-equilibrium structure, so it's meant to really... Um, uh, 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 build a data set for, um, for running molecular dynamic simulation. It's also an active learned data set, so that's a key difference as well. And no matter what he could do, he couldn't actually match my results on testing on this extensibility benchmark. So you could imagine a case where you publish a paper and you just show this, and you claim victory, I win. <laughs> and so Nick and I always argued, <laughs> why is this? Well, you know, what, is, what is this reason that's holding it back? And eventually what, what he found out was that, you know, we need to have add higher body order information to it. And then Hippinen quickly starts to outperform Annie on this Annie one x data set, and even in the extensibility comp six region. This benchmark contains, so basically that data set's about 15 atoms on average size, nothing over say 50-ish atoms. This uh, uh, benchmark contains proteins, small proteins, quantum chemistry calculations from them. So it's really like what I would consider to be a more, one of the more rigorous benchmarks. And I'm very biased, by the way. Uh, and, uh, a, you know, there, is, there are strengths and weaknesses to benchmarks that we really need to think about. Strengths, they're easy and they're accessible. That's great. Weaknesses, they become the target, potentially hurting our progress on developing these potentials. So uh, we should think about that as we're developing these models in the future. Um, now I'm going to talk about, I believe, yes, scaling uh, neural network and atomic potentials to exascale. So there was some really exciting work done uh, by Harvard recently that looked at scaling uh, Allegro to about 5,000 NVIDIA A100 GPUs. Uh, this is work by uh, Anders, who's here? There he is, back there. And uh, Albi, he, he's also going to be here this week. And um, they basically show really good scaling on these biosystems, uh, up to 44 million atoms, uh, which is uh, it's HIV capsid plus the water, and then uh, really good weak scaling as well. Uh, and then there's uh, work at University of Florida, also plugging Torch Annie into LAMPS. Similar story, able to just plug in and get really, uh, really accurate results out of it. Um, the thing that, you know, is really interesting about this is it takes a student a lot of time to plug these machine learning potentials into LAMPS. It also means that if, say, you just build a, uh, an interface like this, that you then have to include that code as part of the LAMPS package. So something we uh, recently did in NVIDIA, um, one of our dev techs, Matt Betancourt, worked with uh, the LAMPS developers on uh, basically taking, they had this PyTorch MLIP interface that was to the CPU only portion of uh, LAMPS. And it turns out there's quite a bottleneck when you try to run uh, molecular dynamics with the force field being on the GPU and then the MD being on the CPU. So a whole lot of memory transfer that needs to happen to actually becomes a bottleneck when your model is fast enough. Uh, and what this interface allows people to do is to import and use their uh, Python-based machine learning interatomic potential at runtime just by developing an interface within their own repository. So that it doesn't need to be included as part of LAMPS. Uh, I think there was the JAX work. Uh, yes, <laughs> the JAX work on this from this workshop. Very similar story. It's really, it's really the things that we need to be doing is 
to enable these machine learning potentials is uh, allowing easy access for people to plug their models in, for developers to plug their models into them, and then for users to download those models and uh, apply them. Uh, our initial result, result showed a 3x speed up over the original CPU bound MLIP. I, it's probably more than that now. These are pretty old results, um, but I'll show some newer results. So uh, there was, oh, so HIPNN, which is a Los Alamos based machine learning and autonomous potential, it's a message passing based model. Uh, we plugged it into this MLIP Cocos interface, and what we're able to see is that, um, uh, oh, so basically this paper just generalizes the HIPN and architecture to a higher body order than just scalar. That's effectively the, uh, the idea behind it. Um, and it, it, it achieves uh, competitive results with other MLIPs with a fraction parameter count. So we were trying to really build a lightweight potential that would try to be as efficient as possible. Uh, and what, what we played around with uh, the Allegro Silver data set, basically, uh, actually Nick, Nick Lovers played around with it, I didn't, uh, and built a, a model that was capable of about 4 million to 10 million gradients per second evaluation, just depending upon the L value that you set your, um, your model to. So um, the original scalar potential is over, over 10 million gradients per second, which is extremely fast. Um, if you need more accuracy, though, it does end up coming down. And, uh, basically, the L equals 2 is roughly the speed of, of the Allegro model for this specific benchmark. Uh, and the maximum performance achieved here was around 100,000 atoms. Uh, I believe this was initially a million atom system. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, that's it. So um, an interesting problem that shows up with scaling and uh, message passing neural network potentials um, is something you don't see with these uh, fixed atomic descriptors. And this is a problem I've been thinking about how to solve it. And I'd love to hear if anybody in the audience has any ideas about how it could easily be solved or if it's going to be just the uh, nightmare engineering problem that I think it's going to be. Um, so basically, remember the original picture. We have some system, one atom per GPU. Uh, in the case of uh, domain decomposition, like you do in LAMPS, you see something like this atom now, uh, the system now decomposed into domains uh, where this atom needs to be able to see all of the things in this region here. And so you have to include a ghost region that shows up on this number five GPU. Um, and when you do that, that works great for these fixed atomic descriptors that have a you know, fixed uh, local distance uh, in the cutoff radius. However, if you have a message passing model that iterates, um, that's no longer the case. So on the first interaction, it just looks like a local model. That's the red circle here. On a two interaction model, you now see that the, uh, the potential distance that you need to look out actually exceeds the ghost region that was originally set for the fixed cutoff radius. Um, and so this actually now means that you can't use these message passing potentials in the current way that LAMPS is set up. Um, uh, and, and so now if you go to three interactions, the problem gets worse. So, you, you know, you, you say, well, you could just include all those neighbors. Well, now there's no point to do domain decomposition because you're including effectively the whole system. <laughs> uh, so how do, we, how do we solve this problem? Well, one way is to have uh, GPU to GPU latent space transfer uh, between steps. Um, so you, you uh, basically have to then transfer your messages every time you... Uh, every time you do an iteration with a machine learning potential, which is kind of a process that needs to be very closely interfaced with the actual inference of the machine learning potential, um, especially if it's in a machine learning framework. So that's difficult to do. It also has to be pretty much built into the MD package uh, when I think about it. Like, I can't think of a better way of doing it to actually get really large scale out of it. And by the way, the Allegro model, it, it, they developed it specifically to be fully local to avoid this problem. <laughs> so if, if this problem ever is going to be solved and, and enable these models to be scaled, um, it's something we really need to think about. And then so, you know, third iteration, if you're doing this kind of uh, memory transfer between, uh, between GPUs, uh, it requires a really, really big GPU memory transfer as well. I've done the math on it. It's really, it's pretty close to... I think it would end up turning out to be a bottleneck unless you had just the absolute fastest or biggest bandwidth you could, you could imagine. Um, so I guess the solution one was build these in message passing into the MD packages. So build the ability to transfer these latent spaces. 
Um, solution two, build the scaling into the model architecture itself, which I think is going to limit you on scaling at some point because the MD is all going to be on a single GPU and you're going to have to transfer back and forth between uh, all the kind of slave GPUs running the model and that single GPU. Um, or solution three, wait for auto inference scaling frameworks, which um, I have not been able to find. If you know of one, please, please let me know. <laughs> uh, and uh, so to summarize, uh, I think we need, you know, basically faster models, data generation frameworks, uh, models and code that's usable by non-experts, uh, easy to use interfaces, common MD packages such as in the IP Cocos, and you know, this workshop's focused on materials. I leave this here because it really still is a question for biocodes. Um, this is really a problem that's that's holding up a lot of a lot of uh, development in that space. And then uh, common physics functionality, which we kind of went through earlier, and then. Uh, better approaches to validating in an IPs, which I think you guys mostly covered all of these. <laughs> so pretty awesome workshop, and it looks like you're all doing really good work. Um, while I still have a few seconds, um, uh, you know, part of my job at NVIDIA is to make sure that we are building the software and the hardware that you guys need to be able to, um, to, to be successful in your research. So anytime you have ideas, problems, feel free to reach out. Um, I should have put my email on the slides and I didn't, so if you want it, come uh, get it from me. <laughs> and uh, I thank you. I'll take questions. <laughs>